This morning's scripture is from the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. You, if you want to follow along on the board behind me or in the Bible, it's located on page 951 in your pew Bible. Verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. And this is all about robbing God and his answer to the people when they asked him about that. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, thank you for your, your word through scripture. Now, Lord God, may your Holy Spirit rest upon us this day, that as the scripture is read and proclaimed, that we may be filled with hope, with wisdom, with power and peace in the salvation of our souls. Now, Lord God, may your word come through me. One more opportunity for us to try to get it right. Amen. The gospel lesson is from St. Luke. Chapter 12, beginning in the 13th verse. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich towards God. There's a story about a guy, we'll call him a saint of the church, one of those real faithful folk who always seem to have the right words and, and the wisdom to put them together appropriately. And there's this young guy or, or woman who is ready to set the world on fire. And so these two were talking, and the saint of the church said, so what are you going to do? The person said, I'm going to learn a trade. Then what? Well, I'm going to start up a business. Okay, then what? I'm going to make a fortune. Saint said, well, then what? Person thought for a few minutes and said, well, I suppose I'm going to die. To that, the saint asked, and then what? This morning... We ought to address that last question, the then what's. And we take this story of the rich fool. I always hate that word fool, but this rich person, really probably a good person. And Jesus tells of the hazards of the abundance of wealth, the, the abundance of stuff. This person had the abundance, even had to build new barns. Had to go to one of those places where you rent a whole garage, you know, build it up. 
and just kept on going, kept on going. And he looked back and he said, boy, I have everything I could possibly need or want. I have my backyard filled with new barns and sheds, and they're all full. The basement's full, the attic's full, the garage is full. I can sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. To that, God said, well, that's great. But guess what? I'm calling you home. Now, whose stuff is it? This morning is about checking our priorities. What is ultimately important? Wealth and, 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 and being rich is a relative term. I, I always hate that discourse in our, in our political realm, but it's a relative term. We all know that as Americans, we are wealthier than the vast, vast majority of people throughout the world. Even the poorest in our nation is wealthier in comparison to many people. Wealth is relative. We may think we can sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. We may think we're wealth or wealthier. We may think or know somebody who we think may be rich. But the reality is there's someone who is always richer. There's always somebody who has more stuff. You know, like that old bumper sticker, he who has the most toys wins. There's always somebody who has more toys. Then we have the method of determining wealth, and those are always interesting tools too because sometimes we look at the size of somebody's home, the, the, the size and, and number and type of vehicles they drive, the toys they may have, the lawnmowers, you know, those big ones that you can, you can ride on and everything and pick up the grass and the, and the leaves, you know, that's, that's something to covet, you know. We look at those things, we look at bank accounts, we look at how someone may dress, and we may determine that they are wealthy. So goes our culture. The bottom line, saints, is we oftentimes judge people by what we think they have or what they may lack. And in the same way, we judge ourselves. Worldly riches are not inherently bad. Wealth is not necessarily evil. But guess what? It's all transient. Just ask any of the mission team that went to Joplin the first year and see how quickly that stuff can go away. Literally. So we see this rich guy in the parable, not a bad guy, look forward to his retirement as some, some of us do, some days more than others, was looking at that, proud of his accomplishments, comfortable for a while. But he had so much that he needed a bigger place to store stuff. So he just kept accumulating more and more. He tried to make bigger barns. I don't know if this is a law of physics. And I know we have a few engineers in the house this morning. But if you have an empty space, it's going to get filled up. If you have a basement, it's going to get filled. If you have an attic, it's going to get filled. If you have a garage, it's going to get filled. If you have a shed, it's going to get filled. And so what do we do? We build another shed. And guess what? That's going to get filled up too. Several years ago, I asked a person, he had these 40-foot these trailers in the back of his, his house, way back in the woods, and I said, what's in there? He said, I don't know. You don't know? No, 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 that's just stuff I might use someday, but you don't know what's in it. No, but you never know. He just kept accumulating more trailers to put in his backyard. 
Dr. Seuss said it, said it well in the story of the lifted Lorax. Remember that story? It tells about this thing, person, you know how Dr. Seuss makes things, called the Unsler. Now the Unsler had this idea. He looked down and he saw these trees called truffula trees. Truffula trees are trees that everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And he said, I can do something with these truffula trees. I can make, a, I can make, make something that, that, that from the truffula trees that everyone, everyone needs. And so he, he began to cut down the truffula trees and he hired people. He had a factory. He made uh, out, things out of truffula trees that everyone, everyone needs. And he biggered 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 until he got so big all the truffula trees were gone. And when the truffula trees all went, resources depleted, his customers were gone, the animals were gone, the workers were gone, and the story goes that the unsler was sitting in the middle of an empty factory. And the Lorax, again, one of those nondescript things that Dr. Seuss would create, was standing on a stump of a truffle tree, reminding the unsler what he had done. You see, the unsler lost track of what was truly important. Just as the man in the parable this morning lost track of what was truly important. For he became rich in things, but poor in soul. So in real life, we have to ask ourselves, where is our center? Who is in our center? Who's directing our thoughts? Who's directing our hearts? Because if we're an unsler, there could be an issue. Poet David Witt wrote, I do not want written on my tombstone when people finally struggle through the weeds and read the inscription there, he made his car payments. Wouldn't that be great? To be known as a person who made their car payments. We preachers try to speak for God. I'm not sure of this, but 99%, I don't think God cares about our car payments. God doesn't even care what kind of car we drive, if we drive one at all. God doesn't care whether we need a bigger barn for our junk. Not junk, I'm sorry. Stuff that we may someday need. Doesn't care about those possessions, material possessions. Because again, they're all so transient. There's an image in my head and I have yet to get out, and I'm not so sure I want to get it out, was well, the first time I was in an intensive care unit down at Duke, and the first time I saw someone die. And I looked over to the left, and I remember it clearly. It was one of those folded, folding chairs, you know, like we sit in. Oh, it had one of those personal belongings bag on it. You know what? The man died. You know where that personal belongings bag went? Nowhere. It stayed right there. What value is it anymore? God has given us incredible abundance. In fact, Jesus said, I haven't get, come just to give you stuff, but to give in abundance, but it's not stuff. It is, it is spirit, it is joy, it is faith. It is the blessings. 
That's the abundance that God gives to us. And God gives us this abundance to be used because the need is so great around us. You know, there's no class warfare with God. God loves the poor as much as the rich, as much as the middle, and everybody in between those categories that we have created in this life. There's equal love. But when we cannot see beyond our own need, when it's our way or the highway, when we use or withhold gifts to God to make a point, we have lost our way. You know, Malachi sometimes is a difficult chapter to read. But what Malachi affirms is that God is saying, look, you use your gifts that I have given you. And you will be blessed beyond measure. You will know the power of God. In fact, God says, put me to the test. Even a tougher test than a math test, John. God says, put me to a test. And I'll show you. You see, we're all stewards of what God has given to us. A steward is someone who takes care of someone else's stuff. Guess what, saints? We're someone else's stuff. We're God's stuff. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Our life is a gift from God. Our opportunity to create wealth is a gift from God. Our opportunity to have stuff, to be able to build barns, is a gift from God. Everything we are is a gift of, from God, and we are called to be faithful stewards of those gifts. Being rich in God is the ability to acknowledge that we're not our own, but we're God. Being rich in God is about remembering who gave us the life, who gave us eternal life, and what a gift it is to share that. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement in England, wrote this in his journal, gain all you can, Save all you can. Give all you can. You see, giving is an incredible gift. No matter how little or how much you're able to give, giving is a blessing. It is a joy. It is a joy and a blessing because people need the love of God in their life. They need hope. They need the comfort of knowing that God is with them through good times, through bad times, through sunny days and and days of the clouds that hang dark and heavy and will not let the sun shine through. People need God in their life. They need to know the joy of faith. That's why the church exists, saints. Saints. It is the most important part of your life. There is nothing more fundamentally important than your gift that God has given of your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that gift can never be blown away by a tornado or a hurricane can never rust or rot away. That gift that acknowledges that all we're called to do is love God and love neighbor with our whole heart, mind, strength, and soul. It makes a difference. Your witness of faith, saints, 
makes a difference in the lives of other people. And when you make a difference, when you use the gifts God has given you, you will know what it is to be truly rich in God. Remember when Jesus was baptized? He was down there with John in the river. And the sky opened and said, God said, this is my beloved, my son, the beloved with whom I'm well pleased. Guess what? You are God's beloved. And as God's beloved, all of us, you, me, have a calling upon our lives to witness this good news, this essential news that God brings through this thing we call church. The church is not about a building. It's not about projects completed or not completed. But it is about Christ, offering hope, renewal, joy, and the full and certain knowledge of the promise of God, that God will be with us all, even to the end of the age. That's what it's all about. It's about God being with us now and always. That is the message that has enlivened our souls. Where your treasure is, so goes your heart. That is what we do when we fulfill God's calling by our prayers, our presence, our time, our finances, and witness. I wanted to share something with you. It's from a fella by the name of Bill Kelly. And he's uh, now preaching, or probably is preaching, but certainly worshiping in the great church triumphant. Uh, if you're a dog lover and never hear of Bill Jack dog food, uh, he was the Bill and the Jack. Um, he was part of Thompson United Methodist Church in the Far East Side and on the 50th anniversary of that church this was, written, this was presented it's something uh, by William Henry Body and when he, he gave me this he said Tom he said ever since this was written uh, told me in Thompson in 1940 he had it in his wallet. He took it to the Second World War with him. It was in his wallet until the day he died. And I'm sure it's in his soul as well. Let me, let me share this with you uh, that might give you a different perspective of what the church is all about and its importance of the thing we call church. Uh, before I was born, my church gave to my parents ideals of life and love that made my home a place of strength and beauty. In helpless infancy, my church joined my parents in consecrating me to Christ and in baptizing me in his name. My church enriched my childhood with the romance and religions and the lessons of life that have been woven into the texture of my soul. Sometimes I seem to have forgotten, and then when else I might surrender to foolish and futile ideals of life, the truth my church taught become radiant, insistent, and inescapable. In the stress and storm of adolescence, my church heard the surge of my soul, and she guided my footsteps by lifting my eyes towards the stars. When first my heart knew the strange awakenings of, of love, my church taught me to chasten and spiritualize my affections. She sanctified my marriage and blessed my home. 
when my heart was seen with sorrow and I thought the sun could never shine again, my church drew me to the friend of all the weary and whispered to me the hope of another morning, eternal and tearless. When my steps have slipped and I have known the bitterness of sin, my church has believed in me and wooing me she has called me back to live within the heights of myself. Now have come the children dearer to me than life itself, and my church is helping me to train them for all joyous and clean, Christly living. My church calls me to her heart. She asks for my service and loyalty. She has a right to ask it. I will help her do what others, uh, what she has done for me. In this place in which I live, I will help her keep a flame and aloft the torch of a living faith. Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let our souls look up with a steadfast hope. And my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the place where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the precious bleeding side. Lord Jesus, as we are drawn to you, as we give as we are able, consecrate our lives, Consecrate our offerings, our pledges, and may our lives do that work that you have set before us. Lord Jesus, consecrate us now that we may truly be your witnesses to the world around us that truly needs you more than anything else in the world. Let the people of God say, Amen.